Welcome to the Elk Talk Podcast with Randy Newberg and Corey Jacobson. Presented by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. The goal is what little you and I know about elk hunting, we share with people. I've got an elk building that's like 120 yards away. What do I do? First off, the thought would never cross my mind when an elk's being 120 yards away to call anybody on a cell phone. <laughs> All elk. All the time. Only elk. Only elk. Well, it's us having conversations. So we usually go down some rabbit holes. But if you hunt with Corey Jacobson, you will find the landscape is full of rabbit holes. We're just going to make this up as we go. And you look at it like, oh, that's a target rich environment. But if you're trying to single one out, a solo target there is much easier to go into than a, a big group. Well, we record everything, so there's no BS and no lying, no faking it with us. <laughs> Did we hit the record I button? I forgot to hit the record <laughs> button. If you want to know something about elk hunting, this probably isn't a podcast to listen to. <laughs> Could we give them a list of all the other podcasts wow. where they might learn something? <laughs> Hey folks, Randy Newberg here, and uh, on the other headset is the man himself. <laughs> I don't know about that, but Corey, Corey's <laughs> over here on the other end of the headset, if that's what you're looking for. Uh, well, you're the guy everyone wants to listen to, Corey, so I should just kind of be the narrator and the the interviewer interviewer I don't know and who, you should be the interviewee. I don't know who gave you that false information, but... Well, it's uh, that's early what we're morning going with today. Early morning today. Randy wanted to uh, get a jump start, so he made me get up early. And so I don't know if anybody's going to listen to my scratchy, deep voice this morning. Well, I've I've had one cup of coffee. I probably needed three, but we're going to go on one today. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So with that, I I got a timer on Corey. We're going to see how quickly we can do the sponsor plugs. Really? Yeah. Okay. How, how quickly you do you ready? think we can do it? Yeah. All right. The Elk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, ensuring the future of elk, other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage. To become a member of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, go to rmef.org. Wow. That was impressive. The elk, <laughs> how about that? <laughs> that huh? was good. So the Elk, Talk Founda or the Elk Talk Foundation. There we go. The Rocky Mountain Elk <laughs> Foundation, in addition to the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, the Elk Talk Podcast is brought to you by Sitka Gear. And Sitka Gear has had a mission for uh, about the last 12 years of turning clothing into gear and making quality clothing that allows you to micromanage your microclimates and uh, regardless of what conditions you're in, stay comfortable and stay safe in the field all day long. And then if you want really, really good knives, multi-tools, and other things in the field, I suggest you go to gerbergear.com. Uh, Gerber makes amazing tools, amazing knives. Uh, I've been using for years now since they came out with it. The uh, Vital Replaceable Blade Knife and the Big Game Vital which is another replaceable blade knife with his, a much longer blade. So go to GerberGear.com and you will get all the scoop on really, really good, uh, I don't know if, not just elk, heck, everything. Elk, deer, antelope, whatever you need a knife for, they got it. Fish, multi-tools, everything. Yep, all the above. That's right. Uh, Elk Talk podcast is also sponsored by OnX Maps, and Randy and I have spent a lot of time talking about OnX Maps, and for good reason, uh, they are just a vital component to have in your pocket, in your hand, in the field, and so many applications with the app. Uh, I don't even carry a GPS anymore. Just the Hunt app on my cell phone allows me to navigate and turn on just about any layer you could think of to see private public land borders, to see management units, to see trails, systems, uh, creeks, mountains, contours, topography, everything you want to see to help you navigate, to help you uh, stay safe, to uh, help you hunt better and hunt smarter. So Onyx Maps, if you go to their website at onyxmaps.com and use the promo code ELKTALK, you're going to save 20% when you sign up for a membership to their Hunt app. Got to have it. And then 
we're going to get into this one in great detail because today we're going to talk about the Wyoming application stuff. So real quickly, what you're going to hear us talk about is the Go Hunt Insider. Go to GoHunt.com, sign up for the Insider and get $50 of free store credit when you use the promo code ALK talk actually and that's all we'll say about them for right now because we're really gonna drill down into that later and actually there's not even a promo code needed you just go to gohunt.com forward slash elk talk and they automatically know that we sent you there and you don't even have to use a promo code so you can go to gohunt.com oh. forward slash elk talk and get signed up and you're going to get the 50 dollars in free store credit in the form of a gift card cool oh. and like it i like it too And the last sponsor of the Elk Talk podcast is Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. And Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls was the original uh, developer of the pallet plate diaphragm. And if you have ever looked at diaphragm calls, you've certainly seen the pallet plate or some form of it, the tone top, uh, some kind of a dome on top. The purpose of that is to make it more consistent, to be able to move the diaphragm in your mouth to find where it's comfortable and still be able to have the consistent result with that palate on top. And since then, in the last 28 plus years, uh, a lot of other innovations in elk calling all made uh, to make elk hunters better hunters, to make elk calling more consistent and to make more quality sounds. So if you go to RockyMountainHuntingCalls.com or BuglingBull.com, Either one will take you to the same place. You're going to save 15% on all of your elk call needs by using the promo code elk talk. Wow. Just remember that, folks. Promo code elk talk. I think that's the fastest we ever got through the sponsor plugs. It is. So we appreciate people hanging with us while we do that because they're the ones who make this possible. Absolutely. Without them, no elk talk. <laughs> <laughs> or if the if people want elk talk, they just have to come and drive around in the truck with me. Which <laughs> would they wouldn't learn much there either. They might hear some old hunting stories or some lies and stuff like that, but that's kinda like listening to Elk Talk podcast, right? Yeah. Before we get into Wyoming, because uh, let's see, it was Monday the fourteenth. I think that was what Monday. I don't know. I'm so lost with dates. Can't remember. Anyhow, this week, Wyoming put out their uh, application booklet for non-residents. And again, the first state out of the chute, if you want to apply for an elk tag, is Wyoming. The deadline is January 31st. And uh, But before we get to that, I forwarded you that email, Corey, from Peter Clark. Yeah. It's a follow-up to, to last week's uh, or the last episode about the strength. Someone had asked a question about what we do to do, I guess, <laughs> do what we need to do. Uh, how, do how do we stay in shape? I don't do a very good job of it. Uh, but Peter heard our answer, and it cracked me up at the bottom. Because his his uh, PS at the bottom is exactly what your first sentence was when you <laughs> answered the question. <laughs> and Peter, what what is, what is he? He's a so, fitness coach at Gon- Gonzaga, or was at Gonzaga for yeah, eight he was years a or fitness and strength coach at Gonzaga University up in Spokane. And uh, and I didn't. That wasn't my first answer. I actually cut you off as you said elevation mass. I said stop right there. <laughs> Okay, yeah. And, and Peter, in <laughs> his go. in his email, Peter said, Corey is right, stay away from elevation masks. There are some good applications, but they are worthless in simulating higher altitudes. So there you have it from somebody well, who actually knows something instead of Randy and I just making things up. But somebody agrees with us, safe, that's good. Yeah, is it safe to say that nobody's going to be uh, sponsoring us who's in the elevation mask business? <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe somebody has a one that will actually work in that application and they want to send it to us to try. Oh, okay. Well, I'll send it to Corey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there were some good things in there that I thought were uh, were interesting without going into the whole detail. Peter went into a, uh, a really really good explanation in it uh talked about uh his approach to fitness and that he he agree he did agree with our answer that hiking with a heavy pack he says on the podcast you both mentioned that hiking with a heavy pack is your best method for preparing for elk season 
This is true. Nothing else you can do in the gym prepares you quite like doing the actual activity. Ha. No. So I'm not completely out to lunch. Right. No, and they they call that SED, you know, the SED principle, which is specific adaption, uh, ap- adaptation to impose demands. So it's, you know, if you're going to be hunting in the mountains with a heavy pack on, the best way to train for that is go to a mountain with a heavy pack on and hike around. And I yeah. think that's true. There's definitely some benefits to being in the gym and, and doing some other things and doing cardio that's not necessarily hiking with a pack on. But if you're coming from somewhere uh, lower elevation, going to high elevation, and you want to be, have your body as in tune with what it needs to be doing in the mountains with a pack on, you need to go to the mountains with a pack on. Yeah. And he did, he did get into a good explanation of the benefits of strength training. So I, I might have to add that to my hiking regimen. But anyhow, Peter, we, uh, someday you might end up being on this podcast if you're not (laughs) careful. I think it, I think it would always be good to have other people come on and either, uh, counter what we said or, or agree with what we say. And obviously as a strength trainer, athletic trainer at a major university that works with elite athletes, having somebody with his experience on here to validate and go into a lot more detail than what we know would be incredibly beneficial. Yeah. So I just kind of wanted to close that loop because when that email came in last week, I thought, darn, I wish we would have had an expert like that instead of Corey putting me on the spot and asking me the question. I mean, some 54-year-old accountant who drives a desk for a living, that's the last guy who should be asked the question of, what do you do to stay in shape for elk hunting? See, and I, I think it's just the opposite. I think you're the perfect person to answer that because it's relatable. That's uh, We're all struggling to stay in shape for elk season because of the demands of what we're doing outside of elk season, so... I asked you for a for a very specific reason. Okay. I think it was great. Well, don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask me anymore because we're going to get into some serious talk about Wyoming elk hunting. Before we get uh, there, I've got I've got one more follow up too from last episode. We talked about not being able to see pins or targets at long distance. Yeah, and someone got a solution for me. We've got a, we've got a handful of emails that have come in, and one of them is uh, the one that came from. Uh, let's see, Eric Gardner and Eric just said he's 33 and started to experience the same thing, the blurry pins and target when he tried to focus between them. And he said that what helped him was shooting a sight system with a dovetail and having it fully extended out. So getting the pins farther out away from the riser of the bow, uh, closer to the target. And obviously we're talking inches, not yards or anything right. here, but the farther you can get it out there, I think the, the better your eyes are going to be able to focus on that. And so I do shoot uh, with mine extended out, not as far as it can go, but as far as I want to be dragging it through brush and feel like it's at a, in a safe location there. Um, and I think that does definitely help. The other thing, and this one was brought up, he actually brought it up a little bit, Eric did, but Zachary Warnke uh, emailed and said, uh, kind of talking about the same thing. And he said he would recommend checking out a verifier peep site. And I've seen several of them, you know, clarifiers and verifiers. They actually make them, uh, you can get a, a, a magnification lens that goes in your peep site. Uh, you can get, you know, just a, a verifier or a clarifier, they call it, which is no magnification. It just kind of, it's like wearing glasses there at the peep site level. Uh, the only thing is some states don't allow those you just have to be careful make sure in in your state that they're allowed the only other thing to keep in mind is a lot of times if they get water on them it definitely changes and makes them blurry Uh, so you have to keep those clear but a clarifier a clarifier lens in the peep site definitely can can help out with that as well well i'm i'm gonna try some of those solutions i i do have my site uh, out as far as it can go uh in the it seems to help some and i was just out shooting yesterday and it's amazing how uh depending on the contrast of the target uh it makes a huge difference also because i have some 3d targets that are animal color and then i have this great big white target and it's just so much easier when it's this great big white target (laughs) yeah with a little black dot in the middle that you can see and aim at yeah and 
And then in the evening when the shade is, uh, the side of my shop is creating shade, boy, there's a huge difference between just the middle of the day and then trying to do it at a lower light situation. But totally. That's why we have those wonderful, what do they call it, those pins that are... Yeah, they got a technical name for them. You engineers <laughs> Fiber know optic those. Fiber optic pins. <laughs> yeah. However you want to call that. <laughs> fiber optic. I thought that fiber optic is what you needed if you're going to set up your internet in a high-speed situation. There are there are fibers in your high-speed internet sometimes, yeah. Well, my, my copper is not considered <laughs> high-speed fiber. <laughs> at least you have like internet. Have a, up at my uh, house, we can't even. When you live in the hint, hinterlands outside of Bozeman, Montana, you get this thing called copper. And uh, you aren't going to do anything high speed over copper. But that's yeah. a complete divergence from what we were talking about. But totally, the reason I it came to mind is I'm in the process of uh, rewiring for uh, fiber. And uh, if any anyone listening can explain to me why it costs so much money to rewire for fiber. I think it's a racket. I think they want to take my entire hunting budget and allocate it to installing fiber. <laughs> uh, oh, well, maybe I'm just bitter about about that. But so, can we go to Wyoming now? We can go to Wyoming if we draw a tag. All right. Can we transfer the discussion to Wyoming? How <laughs> we, is that? We can do that as well. And let's All let's right. talk about drawing a tag. How many? How many points do you have in Wyoming coming up? I have zero. zero. I got one. Yeah, we drew uh, good. We drew this last year and hunted Wyoming uh, on the general tag, so we did not gain a point, and we're still sitting at zero. You're pretty, you're pretty fond of that general tag down there in Wyoming. You know, there's just, it's, it's almost like an over-the-counter hunt. Um, you just have a lot of areas you can go within the state. There's multiple units that fall underneath the, the uh, classification of the general units. And so you can hunt a, a large portion of the state. You can bounce around from one area to the other. And we've just got two or three areas we found that, that are consistent producers are able to consistently get into elk. And every once in a while, we'll find a mature bull, but for the most part, we're just hunting rutting bulls and we aren't worried about quality as far as size. And uh, Wyoming General Tag in the areas we found has that. And I think it's, it's important before we get into that discussion to uh, make sure everyone knows in Wyoming, a non-resident has to apply. There's a limited quota and the last, I don't know, four or five years, those tags have all gone in the drawing without leftover tags in the in the general tag area. And a non-resident has to apply through the draw. A resident can just go down to the Walmart and buy a tag for the same hunt, but a non-resident has to apply. Yeah. <clears throat> well, and folks are going to hear me say and make a, make a lot of reference to the Go Hunt Insider as we do this because right now I've got last year's Go Hunt Insider article up uh, related to Wyoming and it goes into serious depth about the uh, general tag and it lists the bull to cow ratio, the harvest success, and the percent of public land in each of these units that you can hunt with your general Wyoming elk tag. These are some crazy success rates. I'm just going to ramble them off real quick, not by unit, but just 26%, 35, 29, 27, 40, 35, 64, 35, 39, 27, 31, 27, 27, 32, 32, 29, 26, and 27%. Those are really high success rates. Did I, for, did I, hear, did I hear you say a 64% success rate for archery? Yep. Yeah, one of them, has, uh, not archery. This is just success rate for the tag, whether you hunted it archery or rifle. And that's another important distinguishing thing. Uh, in Wyoming, if you have the general tag, you can hunt the general archery season, and then you can also go back and hunt the general rifle season in that unit as long as there's a archery and rifle season, which I think all of the general units are archery and rifle. Yeah, and the thing to know about that is the... The archery season in Wyoming is September 1st through the 30th. All you got to do is buy your archery stamp and you're off and running. Yep. And then rifle, is it October 15th that it opens? Uh, 
I'm not sure if that's the same in every one of the general units or if that date is slightly variable. I, I should know that, but I don't. I've never never rifle hunted the general tag over there. We've always just archery hunted. and So I've never looked at, yeah. the, at the rifle, but I know that there's some great hunting in the general units during the rifle season. You can still get into a, a good number of elk and get away from people. So Yeah. And for people not familiar with Wyoming, it does have some complications. <laughs> and all of this is in the Insider Strategy article for Wyoming. But a couple things to think about. Wyoming, for non-residents, has a point system. For residents, there is no point system. And it's a point system that's a preference point system for 75% of the tags and the other 25% of the tags for each hunt code go in a random draw. So even if you have zero points, there's still a chance you could draw. Yep. No, that's a great point. We, we have drawn uh, the general tag. Actually, it used to be almost guaranteed with zero points. Uh, there were up until probably, I don't know, five to seven years ago, there were actually leftover general tags. And so with zero points, you were guaranteed to draw it. And now, you know, obviously there's, there's more people that are in that pool and, and applying. So there are not leftover tags, but they have, they've got it broken into two different tags within the general uh, license. And they call it the regular and the special. And the regular is a less expensive option. And the special is a more expensive option. And that's really the only difference is if you're willing to pay extra money, you can go in the special tag draw and the odds are usually a little bit better in there because it costs more money. So that's, that's really their only differentiating between those two tags is one costs more. And if you're willing to pay a little bit more, you uh, typically get rewarded with better draw odds. So I think the general tag takes two to three points now to draw under the regular and the special still, I think, I don't think you can draw it with zero unless you do it in the, in that bonus round, the 25% random draw. Yeah. La last year, if you had everyone above two points drew the general tag. And if you had two points, your odds were, this is the regular, your odds were 58%. Gotcha. In the special draw, the more expensive draw, if you were interested in the general tag, everyone above one point drew. And if you had one point, you had a 97% chance. And then let me go and look and see what the odds were in the, the, uh, 25% random part of it. Uh, here, if you were in the special draw and you, let's see, there were 397 people in who were applying for the 25% of the tags, or there are 397 tags and 1,353 applicants. So what's that, about a... 20%? 30%. 30%. You're, you're the accountant. <laughs> yeah. Looks closer to 30% without a full shot of morning coffee. Uh, we're going with that. And then in the random draw, or, or random draw for the regular draw, there were 595 tags and 4,200 applicants. So almost 600 tags, about one out of every seven people drew in the random draw so about 14 percent so so that's that, that's a chance uh, that's those are really good odds when you think about it or at least a hunt you can do every second or third year if you're building points that you've proven you and the guys you go with you guys have proven it's a pretty darn good hunt well it's just and, and you mentioned it right there exactly our thinking we kind of count on it every other year or so. And we've had, I think, three years we've drawn over there, three years in a row. So if you draw, your points are gone. You don't get points. So we've drawn three years in a row with zero points. So we've been in that random draw uh, category is how we've drawn that. So it's it's absolutely possible. I don't think we're going to, to apply this year. So we'll build up a point and... Uh, 
you know, it's a preference point. And fortunately in Wyoming, you can just buy a point. You don't have to actually apply. So if you know you're not going to apply there and you want to you know, build points for next year, you can just buy an elk point. And it's a huge, isn't it like July 1st through September 30th or something, the, the period there where you can just yep. buy a point? Just buy a point. So <clears throat> the, the other part, people are probably wondering, well, what's this special slash regular? What's the tag allocation? And again, this insider goes into great detail, but I'm going to give the overview. The, let's, let's say there's 100 tags, 100 non-resident tags in a unit. Well, 60% or 60 of those tags are going in the lower price regular draw. And 40, or the other 40%, are going in the higher price special draw. So if you then go to the 60 tags in the regular draw, 75% of those are going based on the preference points each applicant has. So that means 45 of the 60 are going in the preference point side. And 25% or the remaining 15 of those 60 tags are just going to be randomly drawn. And you were saying that's random is where you guys have, have drawn your, your tag there. So, and then they do the same thing with the 40 tags that are in the special draw. 30 of them will go based on preference points. 10% of them or, or 10 tags will go based on just a random draw. Yeah. It, yep. It's like it says, random. Yep. And the other thing we talked about points and buying the points, I actually just looked it up here on Go Hunt, and it's July 1st through October 31st is the period that you can just go to their website and purchase a point. And for a non-resident to purchase an elk point, it's $52. The really cool part about Wyoming, and I've been doing it since all of my children have turned 11, uh, you can buy a non-resident youth preference point for $10 for any species, uh, deer, elk, or antelope. Moose and sheep are more expensive, but uh, for youth, once they're 11, if they turn 12 in the next year, next calendar year, you can buy them a point in Wyoming. So I started when all of mine were 11, and uh, Isaac will be 16 this next year. So I think he's got five, maybe even six points uh, going into next year. So by the time he graduates high school, he's going to have eight or nine points built up, and it's going to cost me... 80 or $90 to build up those points for him. So it's a great state to uh, build some points for our youth so that they've got an opportunity for a quality hunt at a pretty inexpensive price tag. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, there's a couple things that are unique to Wyoming, or maybe not. Com one is completely unique to Wyoming. It's their wilderness law that we'll get into. Uh, and then another thing that's unique to Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming is hunting with grizzly bears in your area. Um, uh, how controversial do we want to get? <laughs> <laughs> I think we can, uh, we're not on anybody's payroll as far as the fish and game departments or the states. So uh, I think we can, uh, right. we can share our true feelings. All right, so Wyoming has this fluky, crazy law that I, uh, it really gets under the skin of a lot of people, and uh, I don't like it, but uh, once we get to it, I'll tell you what mitigates some of my distaste for it, uh, and that's the wilderness requirement, or wilderness rules that say in Wyoming, a non-resident hunting in a designated wilderness area. So that's not a wilderness study area. It's not just wild, unroaded country. We're talking about something that has been designated as a wilderness area under the Wilderness Act of 1964. You need a guide or a resident who serves as your, uh, they have a, a name for it. They don't call it a guide. It's something else that a resident can be there with you, and that is a way you can get around the guide requirement. I've uh, I've never used that, but uh, it it definitely takes a lot of the the premium elk grounds out of the equation, at least the, on the general tags, for the non-resident who is going to do it themselves. Yep, and it's yeah, it's 
like you had mentioned, if you go into a wilderness area, you can hike all summer in there. You can do anything you want, but you can't hunt there. You have to have a, a guide or like you mentioned, I, I don't remember what they called either a mentor or something, a resident that is willing to take you under their wing. And I, I believe, at least it used to be, I think, that that resident has to be with you at all times. They can't just sign you up and turn you loose. They have to actually yep. be physically there with you. Yep. And they can only take two non-residents per year. Yep. And they can receive no compensation, no gratuity, no anything. So it better be a good friend or family member. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it, it's kind of crazy. I... I I think everybody agrees, even all the Wyoming residents that I talk to, maybe there's a few residents who feel, feel otherwise, but the residents just shake their head as, a, you know, sorry, it's, it's a stupid law, but you're probably never going to convince the legislature to change it. Well, and I think, um, you know, if you, at least from my perspective, from the outside looking in, it's pretty clear why they do that because there's some really yeah. good hunting back in these wilderness areas it's you know it comes down to access it's harder to access uh, somebody who's willing to hike can definitely get in there we've hunted near wilderness areas before in wyoming and you yep. know some of it's within a mile of a road so it's not like you're going back in 20 miles you can in some areas but you don't have to so for somebody that's willing to hike you could get into a wilderness area and have pretty low competition from other hunters in there but it's, you know, from the outside looking in, it's there to protect the outfitters and to give them yeah. an opportunity to exclusively be the only ones that can take a non-resident in there. Yeah. And when you get into the argument, some people trying to defend it will say, oh, well, you know, it's for your own safety. Give me a break. Okay. I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, here, here's an example. There's a wilderness area that... AB, we call it, Absorky Bear Tooth Wilderness Area. Uh, runs right to the Montana-Wyoming line there. It's, there's wilderness on both sides. So for some reason, and this is the to point out the folly of that logic, when I'm on the Montana side, because I'm a Montana resident, I'm going to have all my faculties. I'm going to be smart. I'm going to know what I'm doing. I'm able, I don't need big brother to keep me from getting hurt in the wildness of the wilderness area. But as quick as I go a mile south and I cross the Wyoming border there, I've lost all my common sense. And I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm sure that I, I'm just going to get lost. And I need a guide to to make sure that I don't, get hurt out there I, and I'm obviously I'm being facetious there and <laughs> just pointing out how foolish it is or if you're a Wyoming resident and you've spent your whole life hunting the backcountry wild wilderness areas of Wyoming but then you move to Idaho for employment now all of a sudden when you move to Idaho you need somebody to hold your hand because you're not going to be safe back in that wilderness area you hunted most of your younger years because now when you move to Idaho, you lost all your common sense. It's like, come on, folks. <laughs> well, and to add to the facetiousness, you know, the grizzly bears are only going to stay back in that wilderness area anyway. So that's where it's, it's most dangerous because they certainly won't come out of the wilderness area. And <laughs> when we yeah. hunted, when so, we hunted Wyoming a few years ago, there were so many grizzly bears where we were at that we wanted to go into the wilderness area to get away from them. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're kind of poking fun at that folks. Just know that it's there. So when you apply in some of these units that have a lot of wilderness area, know that some of that, is going to be off limits to you unless you go with an outfitter or you have a resident who can serve as your companion or whatever the the proper term is there. Yeah, um, and you'll see, you know, it look, like looking through uh, Go Hunt here in the insider, when you go into filtering and go into Wyoming and then elk and start drilling down some of the, uh, the categories there, You'll see there are some units that for a non-resident have really, really high draw odds and really, really high success rates. Uh, and there's a reason for that. It's because, you know, maybe that unit is 90% wilderness 
and non-residents just don't apply there because they can't go in there without an outfitter. So if you know yeah. the if you know the area, or if you have a friend that lives there that can act as your resident guide, uh, those there's some great hunting available there in some really high draw areas with really high success rates. Yeah. And I said that there's some mitigating reasons as to why I don't get too worked up about Wyoming and this law. And here's what it is. Wyoming is more generous in tag percentages to non-residents than most other states. Absolutely. I think that, I think, no, I'm, I might have this wrong. I, I should know it, but I don't, I, or I can't recall it in my foggy memory anymore, but... I think 30% of the deer and antelope tags, it might be 20% of the deer and 30% of the antelope. Anyhow, there, most states have this 10% goes to non-residents. Wyoming is double, sometimes triple that percentage for some of their tags end up in the hands of non-residents. And in the elk draw, I'm going to try to explain how they arrive at their number. Statutorily, Wyoming has to issue 7,250, I believe it is, just over 7,000 non-resident elk tags. By law, they have to do that. And what they do is they say, all right, we issued 3,000 of them as limited entry tags. Well, any, whatever it's required to get to the 7,250 total tags, that's what they put then in the general pool. So some years their tag quotas fluctuate. So I'm, I'm just making these numbers up. Let's say this year they're going to give away 4,000 non-resident limited entry tags. That means in the general tag pool, they have to put the other 3,250 in there. So it's not this 10% cap like you see in a lot of states. Uh, uh, they're, they're more generous to non-residents with the total tags they give out. So if everybody can just look at all of those things combined before they get themselves too wrapped around the axle on the wilderness rule, uh, Wyoming's still treating us pretty darn well. Totally. Now on the hunting there, they manage it. You know, and you, you look at, I look at Montana and Idaho and the management um, in those states and it's questionable at times, um, you know, as far yeah. as trying to balance quality and opportunity and how the wolves have an effect on the herd numbers and the hunting quality and all of that. But then you go to Wyoming that has really the same uh, features against it, you know, as far as predators and everything. And somehow they're just able to maintain uh, a solid population of elk above objective, a uh, good bull to cow ratio, a good number of mature age class bulls. And uh, yeah, they're, they're doing something right there for sure. Yeah. Uh, Wyoming does have the luxury of only having about 580,000 residents. <laughs> <laughs> I say that because I think in Montana, uh, we're at, a million, just over a million. I don't know what you guys have in Idaho there. Uh, but that I think that allows Wyoming to allow a ton of opportunity for their residents and still maintain higher quality Yep, and share a bigger piece of the pie with non-residents and still maintain higher quality. It's... I'm very impressed with the the mix of quality and opportunity that Wyoming is able to provide. I agree. It's, uh, so then you, you brought this up, Corey, and I've listened to some of your grizzly bear stories. <laughs> uh, you, if you look, I mean, Go Hunt has a really good map here of what is the the core grizzly bear recovery zone. And then what's the actual occupied range where you could run into grizzly bears? Don't think that in Wyoming, grizzly bears only live in Yellowstone National Park. <laughs> Definitely not the case. <laughs> no, same where I live in Montana. We have grizzly bears spread across the landscape. And 
It creates a unique dynamic, especially in archery season. Uh, I I seem maybe it's because of how I hunt and what I'm doing and the fact that it's still warm. Uh, the amount of grizzly bears I see and sign and my two close encounters, everything's been during archery season in September. And you you guys had more than your share of those instances. You know, we have we, we've been fortunate. We haven't had any close calls or encounters, you might say. You know, like I know you've you know been really close a couple times and had a couple close calls and scares. We haven't had that, uh, but we have definitely seen grizzly bears, been close to them, and uh, definitely seen their sign. And it's honestly, that's the only time when we hunt grizzly country in Wyoming, we will stay in a designated campground. And, you know, rather yeah. than just go out and bivy hunt or just dropping off alongside the road somewhere and setting up a base camp, we'll stay in an actual designated campsite for a couple of reasons. One, uh, there's more people, more activity there, so less likely that the bears are going to be there. And part of that is because there are food boxes. They have actual bear box, bear proof food boxes in those campgrounds. So we can store our food in that. And I guess the bears are, as long as everybody plays by the rules, they know they can't get to the food. And so we just, we haven't had any encounters with bears in camp while we've been hunting grizzly country in Wyoming. Uh, Once we get away from camp though, it's a different story. And there's, (laughs) it's, it's crazy. The amount of sign that you see Every day that we've hiked in Wyoming, we've seen grizzly sign. And it's, you know, either walking a road as we're driving in, walking a ridge, you know, rocks rolled over, logs tore up. There's there's always grizzly sign there. And for the first, I don't remember how many days we hunted there, but for the first several days, we hadn't seen a bear. And so we're kind of getting confident that, hey, there's really no need to worry. Yes, we'll take all the precautions, but we can kind of let our guard down a little bit. And uh, then Donnie shot an elk and... And uh, we quartered it up, packed it out, and it was in a place where we could just hike right down onto a ridge and look across the draw and and see where the carcass was. And we went Mm -hmm. back two days later, and there were five grizzly bears, not sows and cubs, five individual grizzly bears on that hillside. One great big one that was protecting the carcass and the others trying to run in. And, I mean, we we witnessed grizzly bear brawling, you know, fighting <laughs> on the ground, rolling claws and teeth sunk in growling. You know, it was, it was pretty epic to see, but it also was pretty scary to realize there's five grizzlies on that hill. They came out of the woodwork somewhere when we shot that elk and it just made us realize how many grizzly bears there really are. And there's a lot. Wow. Five. I've never, <laughs> I've never had the, uh, inconvenience of encountering, <laughs> encountering five of them at one time. But, the, you know, the, for people who don't live in grizzly country or hunt in, or don't hunt in grizzly country, I, I suspect it's a bit unnerving. Uh, you, you probably end up reading crazy stories, hearing crazy stories, and there's no doubt there's a risk and there's a bit of... Uh, head on a swivel sort of feeling that you're always looking and listening and and it adds a, a different element to your hunting but I I just tell people don't you know don't stay home because you're you're worried that a grizzly bear is going to come and grab you out of your tent and eat you um, again I'm kind of taking that to a far extreme but uh there's some things you can do there's lots of information out on all these websites that the montana idaho and wyoming game and fish websites give you lots of instructions of how to avoid grizzly encounters that's avoiding an encounter is kind of the ticket uh once (laughs) if you can avoid the encounter you don't have to worry about all the other things and yeah sometimes you end up with a stroke of bad luck and, and you can't avoid it, but, uh, yeah. And if you look at, you know, historically the, the attacks, the grizzly attacks, um, most of them, the people aren't doing anything wrong. You know, I, right. either they're going in to recover an elk and they, they're blood trailing and they walk up on the elk and a grizzly bear's already found it and, and kind of claimed it. And grizzlies just, they've got a bad attitude. They just, 
So you walk up on a grizzly yeah. that's either got cubs or protecting a kill, and it's not usually going to uh, it's not usually going to be a pleasant experience where you can just sit back and take pictures. It's that grizzly is usually going to be pretty upset. But um, every year in those areas where we hunt, there are people who get attacked. I mean, every year it's just uh, yep. it's a grizzly hotbed, and most of them happen just from being out hiking and either walking up on a saw with cubs. Uh, there was one guy that was just sitting on a stump and cow calling and grizzly came up behind him. He didn't know it was there. And I mean, the grizzly just saw him sitting on the stump, walked up there and knocked him off the stump. And so it's, it's not yeah. that people are out there, you know, leaving their McDonald's wrappers in camp and eating <laughs> Big Macs in their sleeping bag in their tent and, attracting the bears it's just the the fact of hunting in grizzly country and that's just one of the risks but if you look at it and the number of attacks that there are each year the odds of it happening to you are very low and so i just you know i look at that and remind myself i'm going to be careful i'm going to do all the things i can take all the precautions but i'm not going to let it ruin my hunt because i'm so worried about it that it's it's no longer any fun yeah and you know that in september their grizzlies are in a what they call a hyperphagia they are looking to put on cal- calories beyond <laughs> what you think uh, any living animal could consume uh, because they're getting ready for hibernation in late October or somewhere between late October and mid-November. So they anything that smells like food, they're coming to get it. And it's just how it is. I, I think what we should do at some point in time, we should get a grizzly bear expert on here and actually get that from from someone who studies them knows them hunts hunts them hunts among grizzly bears like we do uh and i bet you they'd have some some interesting facts and tidbits that we're kind of skipping over here as we focus more on the wyoming draw system than specifically grizzly bears definitely and honestly that's why we hunt early in september in wyoming when we go because yeah. as the season goes on, there's more and more gut piles. I mean, that's just, there's more carcasses in the woods and the chances oh. of stepping on somebody else's carcass the last week of September is much higher than the first week. And, yeah. you know, we, most of the attacks that happen are either the last week of September or during rifle season. I would hate to hunt some of those units during rifle season where there's a high success rate a gunshot going off is, is almost like a dinner bell for the Grizzlies. <laughs> and, you know, you're just, you're worried about somebody else has shot an elk here three days before and you're bebopping down a ridge and all of a sudden there's a carcass there and a Grizzly's defending yeah. it. And so we, we purposely hunt early in Wyoming just to minimize uh, those encounters over carcasses and, and bears claiming somebody else's carcass and us unknowingly stepping on it. Yeah. Well, that is, that gets your uh, heart pounding when you step around a log or come around a corner and you see a, uh, a boned out carcass, elk carcass laying there. I remember one year we were filming in Montana, just not too far north of Yellowstone Park, come around this little knoll and there is a dead elk carcass laying there. I don't know where the bear was. He wasn't there on the carcass but there were bear tracks everywhere i could not get out of there fast enough <laughs> i'm like all right randy this could be it <laughs> this could be your one bad day <laughs> so uh but anyhow well uh it's just a reality you gotta deal with in montana uh, wyoming uh probably more so wyoming than any state they have wyoming has the largest population of grizzlies in the lower 48 uh, well, maybe not, because in Montana we have the Northern Rockies population also, but the majority of the Yellowstone population is in Wyoming. So you just have to deal with it and be smart about it and don't let it ruin your hunt. Yep. So Totally. And then going through this uh, Insider Wyoming Strategy article, at the beginning they always talk about things that are new for the upcoming year, and that's the very first stuff I read because I, I've been doing this since Moby Dick was a minnow. And I, <laughs> I worry that 
I just take for granted that everything stays the same every year. And probably the biggest change this year from what I see in the, the booklet I downloaded from the Game and Fish website is they're going to charge a 2.5% credit card transaction fee this year. And there are no paper apps in Wyoming. So it's not like you can avoid the 2.5% fee by mailing in a paper application. You have to do it online. So brace yourself, folks. You got to pay the full fee up front. And with that full fee, they're going to tack on another 2.5% to cover the credit card merchant fee. Ouch. So I was just actually on Wyoming's website here looking to see... Do you remember the cost of a elk license? Uh, I don't, but I have it right here. If I can figure out how to get this document to come up That's here. I, I'm a pretty low tech dude here. So license right, fee right, list right in front of me here. Elk non-resident applic- $692 non- for the regular non-resident. And if you want to go special, it's almost double that. It's twelve hundred and sixty-eight dollars. Right. So plus, if pl- you want, let's see. Then they, so they also charge you an application fee of fifteen dollars. Oh. So it's twelve hundred and eighty-three dollars for the regular or, or for the special. If you add in your fifteen dollar fee, so what's two and a half percent of that? Well, and oh, then also, 30. if you want a bonus point, if you are unsuccessful, you tack on another fifty-two dollars. Yeah. Onto that, so it's thirteen hundred and thirty-five, and at two and a half percent, you're looking at almost thirty-five bucks that yeah you're paying in addition to that. So definitely generate some yeah. revenue, and I guess if you're paying thirteen hundred and thirty-five dollars for an elk license, anyways, another thirty-five dollars isn't going to break Probably the bank. Probably make or break you, but uh, even on the seven hundred and some dollar license, after you add all those fees. That's still another seventeen or eighteen dollar processing fee. Yep. Hmm. No wonder all my crew asks me to front the money for all their applications. <laughs> well, yeah, with your with all of the deer and antelope and elk and everything you're doing oh. there, that you know, eighteen to thirty five dollars per application adds up really quickly. Yeah, when you figure that I have me, Marcus, Michael, Dan, Matthew, Larry. Yeah, <laughs> not good. I, I didn't hear my name in there. <laughs> oh, you want me to start fronting your applications also, well, huh? If they're going to charge 2.5%, I might, uh, I might <laughs> see what I can do. Uh, you know, but if you, look well, at, if you look at bison, you know, bison in Wyoming is over $4,000 for the license. And you yeah. front that, 2.5% of that's another $110. So I know. I, my one indulgence in life is chasing bison. Uh, and so I kind of rat hole my money every year th- uh, thinking Wyoming's going to take my money for a bull bison tag, <laughs> but they don't. So uh, this year though, I mean, you look at that $110 just out of thin air gone. I'm going to have to rethink. It's like buying a $110 raffle ticket with really low odds. I don't know if I'll apply for bison in Wyoming this year with that 2.5% well, transaction just, fee. You know, you look at the $4,400, and that is a mountain of money to have to to put up and apply. But yeah. you get it back if you don't draw. And so as right. long as you have that money, you know, rat hold earmarked for applications, you can deal with putting it up but yeah that hundred and ten dollars you you pay that it doesn't come back to you regardless of whether you're successful or not no i might i might punt on that and go take the hundred and ten dollars that i would have spent or a hundred dollars of it i might buy raffle tickets at for some crazy sheep hunt or something that i would never be able to afford yep so i don't know (laughs) hard to say but one of the cool parts about the Insider article, and I think a lot of people, this is this is helpful for them by putting it all in one place. And and I, right now you're looking at the filtering system. I'm looking at the, the application strategy article. But yep. a lot of people say, well, I'm looking, I'm, Wyoming's my one state. I've been building a lot of points. I want to shoot a, a really good bull. And... 
I'm, I'm only going to list off the first one they have on their list just so people have the example, but Go Hunt gives, a, uh, let's see, 31 units, and they say the hit list of, <laughs> this is the title they put on it, the hit list of limited entry hunt areas to consider for 340-inch or better bulls. And they list the very first column is the area or the the hunt code type, like a dash one, dash two, dash nine. Uh, Then what they think the trophy potential is. Some of these are 340, 350. I'm applying in the wrong units, it looks like. (laughs) Uh, And then the next column is the bull to cow ratio, the harvest success. And then these next two columns are are really handy for people. Uh, Points required in the regular draw and points required in the special draw. So I'm going to use the 2018 strategy article. So the points are based on 2017. It's no secret. Everyone knows that Unit 7 southeast of Casper is a high demand elk hunt. It's got some access issues. So... uh, take it for what it's worth but they say that the top not top end but they the term they use trophy potential says 350 inch plus the bull to cow ratio is 36 bulls per 100 cows which is really good harvest success on this hunt type the hunt code 7-1 is 63 percent the number of points required in the regular draw was nine points true at a hundred percent uh slightly less than nine probably eight and a half and above it was 38 percent then you go to the special draw 73 percent of people drew at eight points and yes there were some random there's enough tags issued to know that there's going to be some random tags also so they do that for 31 uh hunt codes and these 31 hunt codes uh have have some great hunting i i know that because one of these hunt coats my son had the tag this year and uh (laughs) it was a great hunt uh (laughs) so but i'm looking at some of them and a lot of people think it takes a bajillion points to draw some of these now understand that sometimes some years it just fluctuates and some years the the points it takes in the regular draw is actually less than what it takes in the special draw. So some years, not very often, but sometimes you have better odds by going in the cheap draw than the expensive draw. Yep. Um, But I'm looking at some of these. Most of them are, you know, close to maximum points. Uh, Some of them are two less than maximum points. This one's three less than maximum. Here's one that in the regular draw took three points and in the special draw took two points. Uh, Here's a bunch of them where it took the same number of points in both the special and regular. Uh, Four less than maximum, three less than maximum, three less than maximum, eight less than maximum. And are you looking Uh, on, are you still looking on the application strategy i'm just looking on the strategy article where they list their 31 units in wyoming or 31 hunt codes that they think you have a good chance at yep not a there's never a good chance but a better than (laughs) a a better chance than most places of a 340 inch bull yep and so that's you know you're looking at we we talked before we started the podcast about engineering you know terminology and static and dynamic you're looking at a static list so they've basically gone through right. and they've analyzed all the data and they've compiled a list that you can read if you wanted to be yeah. dynamic and change some of those variables you know for your specific requirements you can go into filtering 2.0 and move around so you know you can see and there's an interactive map on the left side that shows you all 101 elk units in the state of Wyoming. And as you start drilling down and setting your requirements or your goals for trophy potential, for draw odds, for how many points you have, for what season, whether it's archery or rifle, how much public land, you know, success rates, all of that, it starts getting rid of the, the units that don't meet those criteria. And you're left with just the units that are available uh, 
in the state that meet all of your criteria. And then you can start drilling down into details in each of those units. So it's more of a dynamic search for, for similar information, but maybe you don't want a 340 bowl, maybe you want a 300 inch bowl and that's, that's your trophy. Uh, filtering 2.0 gives you that dynamic ability to be able to drill down all of those criteria and find the unit that's exactly what you're looking for. Yeah, that's, I can't tell you how much <laughs> I use that. I. It's a good thing it's part of my job because if I wasted or spent that much time searching and, and filtering and this wasn't my job, I'd be fired. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, for <laughs> instance, any work done. to give an example here, if, if I go to Wyoming and Elk on the filtering 2.0 and I put my trophy potential at 300 inches plus, so that means in that unit you have an opportunity to get into a mature 300 inch type bull. That doesn't mean that there's any harvest statistics that you're going to be 50% of the people are killing 300 inch bulls. It's just in that area, it's not known for 350 inch bulls, but I'll tell you this, some of the units we hunt are a 290 to 300 inch trophy potential area. And we've seen 340 inch bulls in there. So they're there, but yeah. I think the realistic expectation is you have a chance to, to, hunt and potentially harvest a 300 inch bull. Uh, I'm a non-resident, so I'm gonna look at the non-resident special just for this example. Uh, non-resident special, first choice, I have zero points. Um, so I'm gonna say I want my minimum draw odds to be 10%. I want a 10% chance of drawing. Actually, let's go, yeah, we'll leave it at 10 right now. And then I'll drill down the seasons. So I'll go into archery general. So these are general units. And then harvest success, I want a 20% chance or better of harvesting. There are no units in Wyoming that offer a 20% harvest rate with a 300 inch bull on the non-resident special tag that you can draw with zero points. So I'm gonna have to so. adjust something there. And that's probably gonna have to be my points. <laughs> and if I go up to, let's say five points, and let's change from the general archery to a limited quota, and now I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There are twelve units that pop up on the map that meet my criteria. So if I yeah. have five points or more, I have a ten percent draw odd on those units. Now the really cool thing is I can start sliding that scale up. So I want to see what my draw odds. I want to see the unit that I have the best chance of drawing. So now I'm up to thirty percent, thirty-five, forty, forty-five. I'm going to go to a hundred percent there are still nine units in Wyoming that I'm 100% guaranteed to draw with five points that meet those criteria. So now I can start adjusting my points down. I'm at four, yep. all those units are still there. I'm at three, all those units are still there. I'm at two, all those units are still there. I'm at one, four of those units are still there. So with one point on the special tag, there's a 100% chance of me drawing these four units that offer a 20% or better harvest rate of a 300 or better quality bull. So now yeah. I can look at those four units and realize that three of the four are in a wilderness area and that's why the <laughs> odds are so high, but one of them, there's one of them there that is not. And so for me, filtering 2.0 is what helps me determine my draw strategy across the board each year. So I go into each state, look at how many points I have, what my draw odds are for each of these different units, and then start basically coming up with a plan for what I'm going to apply for in the multiple states that I apply for. Yeah. So the, <clears throat> the point of all that discussion, folks, is that some people will say, well, I can do all that with spreadsheets and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you probably can if you... <laughs> want to invest that much time <laughs> uh, and or if you're like me back in the day when I first started doing this in the 90s applying in all these dates I had three ring binders and folders and notebooks on every state uh, and yeah I, I had a lot of information in those file cabinets but now it's right there at my fingertips and as Corey was walking through you can do it in a matter of seconds to have it right there in front of you. So. And when we used to do the spreadsheets and all of that, I was focused in on four or five specific units. And I was tracking how many tags were allotted, what the season dates were, uh, what the draw odds were, what the success rates were. 
And just for four or five units in one state, it would still take me 30 or 40 minutes to gather that information, put it on the spreadsheet, go and get the next state and do that. So I had multiple hours invested in just collecting the information. <laughs> then I had to go back through each spreadsheet and try to determine, you know, how to apply and everything. And that's just for those four or five specific units that I had specifically selected. Now I can, it's a, it's a blank slate. The entire state is there. And I can see some of these sleeper units that everybody talks about that, wow, I can draw that with one point as a non-resident and look at the trophy potential. It's incredible. And yeah. I would have missed out on that completely all those years doing my own research. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> one of the crazy parts about Wyoming that people often ask is, what's a type one tag versus a type two tag versus a type nine tag? And they also have type four and type six. But to, to answer that, you really have to look at their regulations and uh, know what you're applying for. Because every year there are people who burn a ton of points on the wrong type of tag. They put in somehow, I don't know how they do it, but type one and type two tags are usually an antlered animal or an either sex tag. Now type three, uh, usually, I think those usually apply for deer. Uh, type four is just about always uh, a cow tag or antlerless tag. I think type six is a cow calf tag and type nine is archery only. So going back to that point we made how you can hunt September 1st through September 30th when we we're talking about the general units uh, there are some of the limited and most of the limited entry units that same situation applies that if you draw a limited entry tag you can go there and archery hunt September 1st through the 30th but there are a lot of units mostly in the Bighorn Mountains and Northwest Wyoming that have a type 9 season the, the units that have a type 9 season, which is archery only, to hunt the archery elk season in those units, you most situations you have to actually apply for the type 9 tag. So you'd apply for 38-9 instead of 38-1. So just know that there's some fluky situations to that. Uh, a lot of units have a type one and a type two tag. Well, they're, both the type one and type two tag are rifle tags during the, the normal part of the season. And very often in those units, if you have either the type one or type two, if, as long as it's not a unit that has a type nine tag. So a lot of units have only type one and type two tags. In those limited entry units, you can go there and hunt the archery season September 1st through September 30th. The type one rifle hunt is usually the earlier season and the type two rifle hunt is usually a later season that happens sometime in November. So the, the type one, two, four, six, nine, that's one that I think trips up more non-residents than anything. Uh, Totally. And I've got confused just, looking at it and I don't even apply for any of those just where we go on the general tag and even finding information just on the general tag is, is confusing enough. If you start looking into each of those specific <laughs> tag types, it, it definitely gets confusing. Yeah. Well, one of the things geographically that you deal with in Wyoming is as you go from the east part of the state to the west part of the state, the amount of private land decreases and the amount of public land increases. So as a general rule, you're going to see better draw odds in uh, areas with um, all other things being equal. If access is a problem, you'll usually see better drawing odds. Yep. As you get further west in some of these really good units, access isn't an issue. So the draw odds may not be that good because like all of us, we want to have a big chunk of public land to just go and chase elk and not have to worry about looking down at our on X system every two seconds to see if we're in the right place. Um, the other thing you get as you travel west is that's the core of the grizzly bear range. And uh, 
you're, you know, there are some wolves in Wyoming, and those are pretty much just about all in the western part of the state. So, there, are, if you have access, there are some really, really good units in, I'll say, northeast, uh, central, uh, maybe even south central parts of Wyoming. But the access is a challenge, and people will look at that and say, "Wow, why are those draw odds so good?" Well. <laughs> because you got to figure out how to get there and how to hunt them. Yep, private so. land in the wilderness areas. I think you know when you when you look at draw odds and you find those high draw odd areas, it's probably going to fall into one of those two categories. It's either a lot of wilderness or a lot of private. And yeah. certainly, I mean that that doesn't exclude anyone from hunting it under certain conditions. So if, if you have access on private or know a local there that does, or if you you know know a a resident that's able to be your companion, resident companion in Wyoming and hunt with you, you can hunt those wilderness areas. And there's some incredible hunting with really good draw odds and really good harvest rates. So just keep that in mind as you're drilling down those units and find those ones that are, look like a hidden gem. There's probably a reason you need to be aware of why and (laughs) not just go spend your points on it. Yeah, and Wyoming does you the favor in the regulations. I haven't looked this year, but in past years, they always have a little asterisk by that hunt type. And the asterisk says, caution, access is very difficult in this unit. Yep. Um, I think they probably do that as a preemptive measure because they get tired of all of the phone calls saying, I didn't know that I couldn't find a place to hunt in this area. Can I get my money back? <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say it. Putting that little asterisk in there saves them hours of customer service with angry hunters who didn't realize why yeah. the draw odds were so good. Yeah. One of the good parts when, when you're just thinking about your overall and, you know, part of why we're doing this is we've said we want people to go elk hunting every year. Wyoming is the first state out of the gate. And the good news is you usually find out, I think it's the last Friday in February or some, somewhere that last week of February is when you find out about your Wyoming results. So that gives you the rest of the year or the rest of application season to be thinking about, all right, I didn't draw Wyoming, cross that off the list. What are my other options? And it helped with planning. But. Or I did draw Wyoming. Now I need to go to my boss and tell him what week I need to take off for season. It's early enough that you can plan for the hunt or for a backup plan. And uh, it's that, like Randy said, it's the first state out of the gate that opens the application period. It's the first one that draws and, and posts result of draw results for elk hunting. And, you know, if that's your state that you want to hunt and you're building points and applying every year and don't hunt, it still leaves you six months to plan out and purchase an over-the-counter tag somewhere and and still be able to go. Yeah. And the the one kind of wrench in the works on that is last fall, the Wyoming Game and Fish Commission, I believe, I think it's set by the commission, not the legislature, has decided that in 2020, they're going to move their elk draw to May to coincide with the same dates as the non-resident deer, non-resident antelope, and all other resident applications. For See, why, wouldn't they, why wouldn't they move everybody else to January? Uh, the, the arguments that were given that I read was that these uh, aerial flights, the post-winter flights and surveys are not completed. And so they're going to, push everything to May after they know what the post-winter flights have said so that they have the correct quotas at yeah. the time the draw is done. So, no, Again, there's a so, state that is actually monitoring the herds and setting seasons according to the herd, not, not according to popular demand. So that probably speaks <laughs> volumes to why yeah. their herds are healthy and other states suffer a little bit. Yeah. Now, if for some reason they change that and go back on their idea, maybe they will between now and then. But it'll be interesting once hunters see, wow, that's going to change in 2020. Are they going to burn more points in 2019 or are they going to sit on more points in 2019? I, 
It'll be curious to see if that affects people and their application strategies. Yeah. I mean, for me, I've got one point and uh, I thought to me drawing anything are really slim. So I'm just going to look at what is a unit that has some random tags and I'm going to throw my name in the hat knowing I'll never draw one of the preference point tags, but maybe I'll luck out and draw one of the random tags. Yep. And uh, I'm, I'm able to do that because my calendar is already messed up for 2019. <laughs> Here it is, 2018. I already know how messed up my calendar is. That's, that's a bad sign. It is. Well, and you and I talked last week outside of the podcast just about our plans for next year and trying to get our calendars to align so we could hunt together. And yeah, I think we're into 2020 already as far as knowing what some of our plans are that, hey, I'm going to draw this tag <laughs> this year and building around that. And uh -huh. It's, yeah, that's part yeah. of the application strategy. And that's, that's why we're doing this podcast and this series of podcasts is to let everybody know what the opportunities are out there because we've spent the last 15 plus years applying out of state for, for non-resident tags and built kind of a strategy to allow us to, you know, meet different needs. You have to have, what is it? 37 elk hunts to fall or some ridiculous number. <laughs> 37. <laughs> <laughs> Me, I just want to draw yeah. a quality tag every five or six years and, and make sure I go hunting a couple times every year. But everybody has a, a different goal in what they want out of a hunt, what they want out of a season. And to be able to understand each state and know which state's going to fit your needs and your calendar and, and all that's super important. So hopefully this little series on applying to each of the states for elk tags is helpful. And I know, yeah. uh, I know we've got to wrap up here, Randy, you've got to get going, but I think uh, just kind of summarizing Wyoming's a great state and it's probably my favorite elk state for the reason of the management of the elk herds there. We can always, in, in the area, and it's taken us a while to learn the areas and to find those little pockets, but we know year to year whether other hunting pressure, different things come and go, but we're able to get into a stable population of elk and have a good hunt. And the scenery yeah. is incredible in the areas we go. I mean, it's just absolutely stunning elk country. Uh, you know, there, there are a couple drawbacks. If you go with the special tag, it's $1,200. If you go with the regular tag, it's still 700 which is not cheap by any means. Uh, you've yeah. got grizzlies in a lot of the, a lot of the units there. Um, but I think overall, the, the pros outweigh the cons for Wyoming. And if you're willing to go through the process and build points and apply and draw a tag, Wyoming's a great state. Uh, I, I rank it right behind the over-the-counter states for opportunity just because you can draw a general tag every one to two years. Yeah. Well, we did have an email from a viewer who said, when you start doing these state-by-state -state things, can you tell everybody that Wyoming sucks? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think you're going to find that as we go through each of these states, we're going to talk favorably about all of them. Unless we talk about Washington, I, I still don't like Washington, yeah. but every other state there are positive things about it and reasons why you should be hunting there. So uh, even Idaho, yeah. I'm going to tell people the positive things about Idaho, even though I'd rather people don't come to Idaho because that's more competition on my turf. <laughs> but I think if we spread the, the love and the positivity to all the states, hopefully something will pique each person's interest for their different goals and hopefully keep the love spread about a little bit. Yeah. Well, uh, one other thing that goes hand in hand with my applications, and here we've focused a lot on how we use the Insider, is my Onyx system. If you look at me in my office, I've got two screens. One monitor has my Onyx <clears throat> system on it. The other has my Insider up there. And when I'm doing a lot of this stuff, I'm going to every one of those units that supposedly have access challenges, the little asterisks in the Wyoming regulations. And people will say, how do you draw so many antelope tags in Wyoming? How do you guys draw these elk tags? Well, because we're handy with our OnX system, just about every hunt we apply for has that little asterisk by it because our draw odds are way higher. And if it wasn't for the, the OnX system, obviously I wouldn't be doing that because I'd 
I'd have a tag, but I'd kind of be stumbling and lost as to where I could hunt. So it's for me, it's kind of a, a combination of tools that allow me to to look it over. I mean, the, the Onyx system has all the walk-in hunting areas of Wyoming, has all the hunter management areas, which if you go to Wyoming Game and Fish website, click on the one that says public access, it talks about these state access programs where they pay private landowners to let you either hunt those private lands or to get across them to get to public lands. So there's a lot of little things you're going to find in your Onyx system that are also helpful in securing a tag that maybe was a little bit overlooked or had, maybe it's got higher draw odds just because of what we said earlier, the, the uh, public private uh, interface. So if you got both those together, you got a serious amount of power right there at your fingertips and you, you're probably gonna end up hunting Wyoming quite regularly. Totally. No, and that's, I think, you know, again, we've spent a lot of time talking about sponsors and, you know, we've shortened our, our uh, sponsor read at the beginning down and, and everything, but these sponsors aren't just sponsors. They're partners. They're, they're people that have tools for us as elk hunters that we firmly believe in and use on a regular basis. And it makes it really easy for us to, to talk about them and share them with the listeners because there's no doubt it will improve their ability to apply and draw tags as well as be successful on the hunt. So that's why yeah. we that's why we say go hunt and on X a lot, especially in these episodes. It's not because we're getting paid <laughs> to. It's because that's what Randy and I personally are sitting here doing right now is we're researching those units and, and those tags. Yeah. So whether it's go hunt or whether it's on X, use promo code elk talk, right? And well, save yourself no. a bunch go, of money. Go hunt, go to gohunt.com forward slash elk talk on X. Use the promo code elk talk. There you go. Yeah. I'm glad you got that straight. It I'm, took me a little bit. I, I've, it's getting close to tax season. And as a CPA, I can't keep anything straight right now. <laughs> I, my wife's looking for a good CPA. I hope I thought I can find one for her. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. well Corey, i i like the these uh podcasts where we can drill way down into one topic and really get into it like we did here with wyoming i i hope people find it useful if they're not applying in wyoming they should start and if they are applying in wyoming i hope they picked up a little nugget or tidbit here about things that we do or things to look at or maybe something they hadn't thought of before Absolutely. Yeah, like I said, Wyoming is one of my favorite states for elk hunting. It's not the best state by any means, um, but for the reasons that, that we've talked about, you can have a good hunt and well, it's not over the counter for a non-resident necessarily, it's, it's pretty close and I count on it at least every second or third year and if we get lucky then sometimes every year for three years in a row. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> since we got to cut this short, maybe next podcast we'll do two Sitka questions of the week and we'll do two Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation access projects. That'll be perfect because you're work. late. You're late for a meeting. Uh, I am, but that's <laughs> just welcome to Randy's world. Yeah. So, but well, thanks for listening, folks. I, I hope that you all draw a Wyoming elk tag this year as long as it's not mine. <laughs> and since I'm not applying, I hope everybody draws this year and and decides not to. You're go not back. applying this year. You're just buying a point? a point. Yeah, just with uh, everything else, we've we've kind of got a plan for uh, our destination elk V2 for next oh, year. Okay, and uh, we aren't able to squeeze Wyoming into that. Although Wyoming was our best hunt this year, uh, we've got a couple other things up our sleeves for next year that are going to take precedence over Wyoming and we'll build a point and definitely be back the following yeah. year. Yeah, well, I I know I'll be there because this is one other thing that Wyoming has that's unique to other states is my uncle Larry drew a limited entry tag in 2018. He's been undergoing a clinical trial of chemo for years and his doctor said, no, the chemo has got your heart so messed up right now, you're not going elk hunting. And he was just tore up. Well, Wyoming has a program where you can apply to reserve the tag for the following year. So 
His limited entry tag that he was not able to use in 2018, his doctors wrote a long explanation and he filled out all the forms. He sent it into Wyoming Game and Fish. And we found out yesterday that their license review board approved Larry's application that his tag will be reserved for 2019. Now, that's to me, that's pretty cool. I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that his health that's... improves where he can go, but... I plan on being in Wyoming for at least one elk hunt next year. That's very cool. And it's not even not even mine, but yeah. So that's uh, yeah. Very cool. Well, Corey. Yep. You have a great day. You too. All you listening. Thanks so much. And uh, until the next time, Merry Christmas, everybody. Yep. Merry Christmas. Thanks, Randy. Thank you.